start. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Chip, who's going to talk about things, especially in singular flat surfaces. Uh, and before she starts, I'll say that there's going to be an early dinner uh, after the talk, so come and talk to Myra. Thank you. Thank you. So, a little more. Okay. So, uh, the work I'm going to talk about today is joint work. Of some other metric, um, 
time related by an isometry isotopic table. It's 
12 study. Um, and here, actually, you get much more rigidity. So it's, it's a classic effect, so much so that I can't in now do first proof this, um, that you have, in fact, an embedding into projectivized RNA S. What is this saying? This is saying that simple closed curves are enough to determine the metric. So S, the simple closed curves, is rigid. And in fact, it was known, at least since Fricka, that finitely many curves suffice. Um, all right, so uh, here my surface, let's say it's a surface of genus G. Then um, just 6G minus 5 well-chosen curves are enough. Okay, and depending on how my time goes, I might be able to draw you a picture of that. Okay, so this is an extremely rigid situation. It just takes some number of curves, you tell me how long they are, only one Poincaré metric on the surface can realize those lines. Okay. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> well, for that negative curvature, let me put this result up next to it. For a variable negative curvature, Well, we've already seen the, the full set of simple closed curves in spectral literature, I'm just copying that. But simple closed curves are not enough. This actually follows from a result of Joan Berman and Caroline's series, where they show that in this setting, the full collection of simple closed geodesics only occupies a small part of the surface. Um, so there actually is um, a great deal of the surface that's completely missed by the locus of all simple closed geodesics. And there, so that's how you can see the non-rigidity. If you just modify the surface away from the locus of geodesics, it can't be detected by the simple closed curves. Okay. <clears throat> and then there's um, actually one more case that I think is a little bit different in flavor and worth mentioning. And that's the case of... Actually, let me leave surfaces now and think about the space of metric graphs. So, let me consider the space of graphs for which I have an identification of the fundamental group with the free group on a certain number of letters. So, this would be for the free group on three letters, and I would label these edges the A's and B's and C's to give an identification here. Okay, now by metric graphs I mean these edges have lengths. So you can ask the same question. You could ask what's the length of a conjugacy class of, of words in the free group in the graph. You could form a length vector that way. So here I'm going to sort of abuse notation and let C be conjugacy classes of words because I'm trying to make an analogy between these cases. Um, here is the case that C is spectrally rigid. So if you know the length of every conjugacy class, you can, you can work out what the metric on the graph was. Okay? Um, but, so here are finitely many curves, simple closed curves suffice. Here, all the simple closed curves didn't suffice. Here, um, what we can say is that no finite subset. This is a result of my involvement. And I bring it up because we're going to actually, um, it, with my collaborators will actually sort of adapt one of their ideas to our situation later. What they do is really neat. They say, if you give me any finite subset, I can find a big um, isospectral deformation family that leaves all those lengths unchanged. So they actually... They find, I'm sure I'm writing too far over on the board, me. They find a 2n minus 5 parameter family.
results.
two different classes of vertices that you're going. And you can see that it has two cone points, each of angle. <clears throat> A crucial thing to notice about these flat surfaces is that in any direction that you travel, there's a well-defined line field. Because when you hit a side, you come out on a parallel side, you can keep going, and you can have a constant slope line field that's well-defined on the whole surface. That's a crucial part of it. <clears throat> okay, so then let's ask our question. Um, these are surfaces, uh, as here and here. They're mostly constant curvature, except at these special points. But they also kind of have a combinatorial flavor. Should the spectral rigidity situation be more like this? This or this? That was our question going in. So let me see a few here. So here one. Um, and this is a case where we didn't know what to expect when we started investigating. Um, but it turns out that um, simple closed curves suffice. So S is rigid. Whenever it has negative curvature, so for genus of these two. Okay. <clears throat> and actually, somehow we get a lot of information here, more than in any of these other cases. We can actually tell exactly which subsets are rigid. You give me a subset and I can tell you whether or not it's enough. That's not true, that, that, that much information isn't known in any of these other cases.
small. Let's recall. We've seen this before. And so I want to spend a little bit of time convincing you that this isn't an unnatural class to study. We didn't just study these flat metrics because we could prove something about them. They actually come up all over in different parts of math. So let me try to explain why this class is important briefly. So here's a classical theorem. Name, I'm sure I can't pronounce. Um, it says, suppose you have two rectangles, and you want to look at homeomorphisms mapping one to the other quasi-conformally. So by quasi-conformally, I mean that on the level of tangent spaces, a conformal map would take circle fields to circle fields, and instead a quasi-conformal map takes circle fields to ellipse fields. So you're allowed some dilatation. <clears throat> So the question, a natural question to ask is, what's a map from here to here that minimizes the quasi-conformal constant, that sort of distorts these circles as little as possible, that's as close as possible to being a conformal map? And you might guess it's the natural map, the affine map, that stretches however much it needs to stretch in, in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. You might guess that you can't do any better, and Groch says you're right. That's the best map. So what Tenkiller does is ask the same question for surfaces. So Tenkiller says, here you have a surface of genus 2 with a particular Poincaré metric. And here you have a surface of genus 2 with some other, I'm trying to make it look different, with some other Poincaré metric. Now, consider the quasi-conformal homeomorphisms from this to this. Can you find one with least dilatation? Can you find the one that's closest to conformal? A type one theorem is yes, there exists a unique optimal map. And what is that optimal map? It's all those. It's called the type one map. What he says is um, there exists there exists flat metrics. Q and Q prime, so that the Riemann surface strip, so let's call this first surface over here um, row 1, and let's call this second metrized surface over here row 2. So there exist flat metrics whose underlying Riemann surface structure is the same as row 1 and row 2, respectively. So in fact, why don't I call them Q1 and Q2? Okay, so we have the same underlying Riemann surface structure as those. And there exists a T such that, well, if you do, so look over here at my beautiful pictures of flat metrics. They're sitting in the plane. And so Grosch's affine deformation is available to you. A nice, natural, quasi-conformal thing to do to these polygons is to stretch them horizontally and compress them vertically, say. And Taekwondo says that's the best way to move around. So the way to write that down is you write Okay, an actual, honest-to-goodness, affine map acts on one of these polygon pictures in just the usual way, so linear transformation, and it carries one of these to the other. Um, and uh, what he says is, this is the, this is the least quasi-conformal So these flat metrics, then, from the point of view of geometric topology of surfaces, are really natural because they're sort of giving you the right coordinates to understand the quasi-conformal structure of the space. But we only have two parameters here, or one parameter, e to the t. Well, there's a whole, so there are many, there's a whole um, sphere of flat metrics that have the same Riemann surface structure as this one. There's a 6G minus 7 dimensional sphere of choices for this and for this. And this is telling you that there's, there's a, a good choice of flat metric here and a good choice of flat metric here, such that one is carried to the other by an affine map. So actually, the picture to have in mind, this gives you a nice way to visualize the time warp space. So I'm going to attempt to copy one of my silly pictures. So this is a point in time warp space 
what you should think is that it's got this whole sphere of directions, and each of those directions is one of my plot structures. Maybe this one here, and this one here. And what it means to travel in that direction is to take that fly structure, stretch and compress it, and just ask for its Raymond surface structure all along the way. By uniformization, there's a unique proc Raymond to engage class as you go. So that gives you a path for type And type is telling you those are the unique, efficient ways to move around. So in fact, I really just defined the type one distance. The type one distance between row one and row two is that T. That's why I wrote E T there, if you were wondering. So it doesn't matter. I'm probably lying by factor two. So. so the Q1 and Q2 are not, not unique. They are unique. They are unique. Yeah. For a given pair. Yeah, for a given pair, row one and row two. Um, type one is existence and uniqueness. So Q1, Q2, and T are all determined by row one and row two. <clears throat> okay, so what this tells us is. Um, so th there's a slight there's a slight issue here, which you may have noticed, which is for this picture to make sense, you need a little bit more information than just the flat metric. You also need to know how it sits in the plane. That is, you need to know which way is vertical and which way is horizontal, because I just told you to stretch it horizontally and compress it vertically. So um, it, speaking properly, what we say is that Q of S which is the space of quadratic differentials. I'll explain the name in a second. S. Um, what are these? These are flat metrics together with a vertical direction. So, a flat metrics with a preferred vertical. Flat metrics in the sense that it's fine with one. So, now that I've written it this way, Oh, I'll just say why it's called this. A quadratic differential on S, you can think about this as a two tensor. The data is, um, you have some sort of atlas for S, so you have a bunch of patches, you have a bunch of charts, and you have a holomorphic function on each one. And what makes this a quadratic differential is the relationship that if you take two neighboring, take two overlapping, Patches, then you have this rule, this transitional. And so, what's nice about this way of looking at it is that if you naturalize these parameters so that these holomorphic functions are just a constant function of one, what is this telling you? It's telling you that the transitions. Well, what are the what are the functions? What are the what are the trans possible transition functions? Such that the square of the derivative would be one. The transitions are given by z goes to plus or minus z plus a constant. In other words, gluings are tra uh, translations with a possible reflection. Okay. So this is a special kind of atlas on the surface. This is an equivalent characterization of flat structures. If you didn't begin the day with polygons, you could say it's um, it's a structure on the surface for which the transitions are semi-translations. <clears throat> okay, so now that I've defined that, I can just, I can say a way to write down this picture is to say that um, flat surfaces are just quadratic differentials up to rotation. Um, when I'm just thinking about these metrics, I don't care which way they're I just can close that up at once. Okay, and this picture over here says that um, I can think of quadratic differentials as the tangent bundle of the type in fact, the cotangent bundle um, the type functions, right? Because every direction is given by a different flat structure. Okay. Um, there's one more place this comes up that I just want to very quickly mention. This also comes up in the study of billiards. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. 
That's right. That's a dynamic system. You might want to study trajectory. I thought about that for a very long time. Well, the connection to flat surfaces is a beautiful one. If, instead of considering reflecting the trajectory in the wall, if instead you reflect the table, the fact that the initial angles were rational angles of pi means that you can unfold it to a surface, and after, after a certain finite amount of time, the sides will tear in the right way and glue up. So, the dynamical system that we began with is isomorphic as a dynamical system to G S it's in the flat metric on the unfolded table. So this is really a natural class of metric. That's my accurate idea um, for why you should do flat class. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Good. So um, all right. Um, let me say one more thing about this boundary for Tychmuller space that you get from thinking about things this way. And um, then I'll tell you a little bit about how some of our results are proved, at least in cartoon form. Um, <clears throat> nothing technical. Okay, so the, the last thing I'll say then, um, before talking about our results, let's talk about PMS. Okay, so this is a go. Okay, so, well, I mentioned before that anytime you have a flat structure, you have a line field in every direction. So I'm going to take one of those line fields and I'm going to call it a measured foliation. So in direction theta, I draw myself all the lines. Depending on the table, those lines might close up into closed curves, or they might be by infinite. <clears throat> For instance, you can easily see that on a square torus, in the rational directions, you'll get closed leads in this foliation, while in the irrational directions, you'll get distribution. <clears throat> so the line field it's measured. In general, the word foliation just means the decomposition of the surface into possibly singular curves, one that holds in this case. This one's measured because by putting it on the surface, it comes with a notion of, of length for transverse arcs. Right? There's, there's the Euclidean structure on this flat surface gives me a distance between leaves. So I can use that if I have an arc that's transverse to the foliation to measure how far it travels transverse to the foliation. That's, that's the notion of a measure. So, let me say two things from the classical First in theory. So first and worked out that um, here the P is for projective, and that just says if I take this whole picture and I rescale the picture, I won't consider those to be any. So just quotient out by rescale. So first and says P amount for that actually works out to be homeomorphic to a sphere of dimension six G minus seven. This is really convenient because the type of space itself works out to be homeomorphic to R is minus 6. You might hope these fit together, and they do. Um, so this actually gives you the boundary of infinity of type of space. It compactifies the type of space in a nice way. Um, Thurston's initial explanation of how convergence works was a little complicated. Um, and by the end of the talk, I'll actually show you a simple way to understand why this is, why this is the right thing. But Thurston's initial proof was a little bit opaque. <clears throat> okay. Are we talking about all surfaces or just flat surfaces here? There are no flat surfaces in the picture here. As is has a fixed topological type, this is the space of all constant curvature metrics on S. So these are the Poincaré metrics. And this is just a space of foliations. So I haven't, this picture, and in fact, first in the definition, did not use these flat structures. He defined them differently. He defined, he defined them topologically, and then introduced a measure, and then projectivized. But it's actually quite elegant to just think about them as coming from the flat structures. So the foliations have to come up with 
what it would have been if you just surgered in copies. Right? See that? Okay, so what we proved was that this inequality is true for a cylinder curves. It's obvious. That's the picture. That's the proof of cylinder curves. It takes a little more work to show that it's not true for non cylinder curves. For non cylinder curves, eventually there's nothing. If you travel through singularities, Eventually, there's nothing more efficient that you can do than just to surgery in a copy of the Nelson curve. So this is the detection process. This is how the length spectrum tells you which curves belong to some curves. Okay, and then we show that once you know that, you can work out what all the foliations are in every direction. Once you know that, you can work out... So remember, we have SL2R acting on these flat surfaces just by linear transformations. So once you know this, you can figure out the whole orbit of Q under linear transformations. And that makes me show what we were talking about before on what's called a tight color disk. This is actually, it's called the HQ because it's actually an isometric copy of the hyperbolic plane sitting inside class. Okay, so it's a little hyperbolic plane. So the last step I want to explain is, once you have just, so from the whole big, wide, woolly world, of the flat surfaces that Q might have been, we whittled it all the way down to just the hyperbolic planes worth of candidates. Okay? And now I want to show you that it's not too hard to get from that hyperbolic plane worth to pick out Q unique. <clears throat> okay, so here's a picture for that.
string some chunks together as many as you want. And glue the sides together and start this chain this chain. <clears throat> okay, so really, it's good enough to give you a deformation family on the chunk. <clears throat> oh, here's how we do it. What we do is we play more actually Euclidean geometry games like this one. And we say, okay, um, here's a way to build a chunk. Take these two cylinders, and I'm not going to show you all the glory comments right in detail, but I want you to do There's a way to glue these four segments to each other to, to recover the chunk. <clears throat> so what, what we do is we show... smiley involvement, that if you take a if you take a non-rigid family of curves, they can be conjugated by the mapping class group into some curves that run over the graph that I've outlined in purple in a prescribed way. Okay, in particular, so if you know something about this theory, which some people here certainly do. Uh, this, is, this is actually what's called a train track on the surface, and it has the remarkable property that um, any curve that's carried by this train track, um, if you know the theory, you know what that means, actually runs along it. Actually, it actually can be realized as a concatenation of its branches. We call these train tracks magnetic, because if you're carried by them, you actually stick to them. Okay. Um, so the point is just, um, you, you construct such a picture, and then you do deformations of the picture. So our deformation families then look something like this. Okay, so we show that once you have a standardized picture like this, you can move it around with enough degrees of freedom. Um, and making sure you're compensating additions in length with subtractions in length on other branches such that all the curves remain on the same line. Okay, so there's an obvious question this raises. Um, in theorem 1, I said we know which curves are rigid, and here I'm telling you this is an operation you can do with any set that isn't rigid, so I should tell you which the rigid sets are. <clears throat> and then I'll stop there. So, it turns out to be a nice answer. So rewriting the thing I just erased, um, PMF as will escape of a certain dimension. Okay, so another thing Thurston pointed out is that the simple closed curves um, live inside PMF. Here's how. Take a surface, take a simple closed curve. I claim I can build a foliation of the surface that has just this as its core curve. So how do you do it? You take the surface and you cut it up along enough other curves that all that's left topologically is a cylinder for which this is the core curve. You can always do that. And since you can, you have your foliation.
And this is the right condition because what makes this construction possible, um, again, for those who know the theory, is that if you're not dense, you miss some open set. And so there's a pseudo Anasov map that carries the complement of that open set closer and closer and closer to this chain shell. Okay, so missing an open set means you can sort of be conjugated over to actually run along these branches. And that's what makes this affirmation chain. Possibly a little bit. 